today uh, to host our Innovating Creativity at Speed webinar. Uh, we brought this together with uh, our friends at Vice Media Group. Now, uh, I'm sure you all agree these have been a challenging last few months and uh, during that time, many of us have been changing. We've been pivoting, reframing and embracing the opportunities that are around us uh, to change our business models and ensure that our businesses thrive long into the future. Uh, now, and part of that is, uh, is making tough decisions, of course, but it's also about uh, embracing and grasping the opportunities uh, that we see to innovate, uh, to be more creative and to do things faster. Because whilst difficult times can be really challenging, uh, and these really are, um, they can also, also push us to achieve uh, better results. So in this session, we're going to be talking about just that, um, how brands are innovating their creative process at speed uh, during this pandemic to deliver work that cuts through uh, and really stands out from the crowd like it never has. Now, uh, as always with uh, all of our events, uh, we encourage interactivity. Uh, so please feel free to use the chat function throughout the session. Um, but for specific questions for our panel, please use the Q&A function. Uh, let us know uh, if your question is for a specific contributor uh, and please uh, keep your questions pithy, please. No, no speeches um, so that we can ask as many as possible. So let's just test the chat is working first, I think. Um, so if everyone can just get on the chat, tell us uh, who you are, where you're dialing in from and how you're feeling today in, in one word. We can just uh, get to know each other a little bit before we start proper. I've not seen much interactivity so far. Come on, guys, wake up. Here we go. There's Tom. Well done, Tom. Uh, Tom's joining us uh, from England. How are you feeling, Tom, in one word? Laura from Amsterdam's joined us. Oh, Tom, Tom's feeling knackered. Uh, he's just done a run. Well, it's very honest, Tom. Thank you for that. Hope you're not too sweaty. Uh, Sharon from Chelsea FC is feeling positive. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we've got Anna from Manchester, uh, feeling ready to learn something new. Great stuff. Uh, Alistair in Dubai is feeling weekend ready already. That's a bit early, isn't it, Alistair? Um, Marcus in London is making lunch. What are you having for your lunch, Marcus? Something interesting, I hope. Uh, and uh, we've got Pawan from Dubai who's feeling excited. And so it goes on. Uh, Saffron's feeling curious. Uh, <laughs> feels chilly and wet. Okay, the, the rain's heading towards me here in London. So the chat is, is definitely working. Uh, it looks like you've all woken up, which is great. So keep using that as we go through the session as you see fit if you want to chat to each other. Right, um, I think uh, we'll get started. So um, it's my great pleasure to welcome our, our panellists uh, who will introduce uh, themselves. Uh, so first up, let's say hi to Rob Newland who is Global President of Virtue Worldwide. Hey, good afternoon, Craig. How are you doing? Um, How are you? And how are you feeling? Yeah, very well. Very well, thank you. Calling from a slightly grey London as well, waiting, waiting for that storm to come through. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to the discussion today. Um, like you said, I'm a President of Virtue Worldwide, so the agency born out, born out of vice. Um, and have also sort of across the years came out of leading all the creative agency groups uh, for Facebook and Instagram um, and setting those up around the world. And then also before that was a, a, a client for, for many years, um, including um, at, at Diageo where, where Mark is now as well. Ah, uh, so Portugal and Gamekeeper. So yeah. we'll some interesting insights from that. So uh, let's now welcome, we're going to go to Singapore now and welcome Lynette Pang, who is CMO of Singapore Tourism Board. Hi, Lynette. Hi, um, a warm hello from um, evening time in Singapore. Hi, everybody. And how are you, how are you, how are you feeling today? Um, well, it's my second shift and I'm trying to be energetic. <laughs> you seem energetic to me. It's the coffee <laughs> and not the champagne. You might <laughs> who knows after this <laughs> now talking of something stronger uh, uh last but certainly not least is our final uh, panelist 
who is Mark Sandys. And Mark Sandys has quite possibly the best title in the world. He is global head of beer, Bailey's, <laughs> Smirnoff and Captain Morgan, that's greedy, at Diageo. Hi, Mark. Thanks, Craig. Thanks very much for, for having me. I'm in Dublin and uh, unusually it sounds like the weather is better here than uh, over with you in London today. The sun is shining. Uh, and how are you feeling? Very good. Really looking forward to uh, uh, the session today. And uh, actually, I can see a few familiar names on the, uh, uh, on the Zoom today. Uh, good, good. Right. Uh, you're ready to get started? Yeah? Yep. Good. So listen, uh, as I touched on earlier, um, this uh, year has obviously thrown up a host of, of new challenges for us all. Uh, it's forced us all to find, to find new ways of working, uh, to adapt our businesses, uh, and also managing our teams and key relationships in, in quite different ways. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you all, what has been the single biggest challenge that uh, you faced during this time? And if it's okay with you, I'll start with you, Mark. That's great. Well, um, the, the timing of when lockdown happened um, from uh, a, a, a Guinness perspective, which is um, the, the largest of the brands that I look after, it basically uh, uh, happened in our biggest week of the year, middle of March in most places around the world, as um, uh, pubs and bars all over the world are preparing for St. Patrick's Day. And we had as with normally is, we had a St. Patrick's Day film um, uh, uh, shot and edited and ready to go. It was all about people going out and celebrating together. And, um, and of course, in those first few days, um, we had to kind of take, take stock. And the first thing that happened, our amazing team in the US re-edited that film to turn it from uh, a film encouraging people to go out and celebrate to a film encouraging people to stay home and mm. uh, to look forward to the time when they would be able to celebrate again in the, in the future. And then I suppose in the weeks and months that followed, I don't know if you all felt this, it, it seemed like consumers mood, the public mood kind of changed almost every week. And it was a real lesson for us in trying to sort of listen out and, and adapt to what we, um, what we needed to be doing at that stage. Um, you know, it, uh, from the start, we went into a phase of supporting the industry, which is facing a huge amount of challenge at the moment, investing to support bartenders and, uh, and pubs that were closed. Um, and also across Diageo, we went from making spirits to making hand sanitizer in all our, our, our distilleries. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting was then watching the way that people kind of started to play around with Guinness uh, um, uh, online uh, in a few different ways. We saw um, a great young Irish creative director called Luke O'Reilly um, did a, a sort of Guinness ad um, in answer to a, uh, a competition of, you know, what would be uh, uh, ads that would successfully encourage people to stay home. And it was so good. We, we then... Um, with his credits, uh, uh, then uh, launched that ad. Um, and we saw lots of people playing around with different ways to pour Guinness at home and dreaming of, um, you know, the time when they could get back in the pub and actually have a pint of Guinness again. And I think probably, you know, the biggest challenge about all this actually led to the single biggest investment that we've ever made in Guinness. I I've worked on Guinness pretty much for 23 years now. The single biggest investment that we've ever made in Guinness was all those kegs of beer that were out in the pubs and bars in time for St. Patrick's Day, we took them back, destroyed them, sent out fresh beer, cleaned all the lines, because we wanted to make sure that that experience that people have been dreaming of, of being able to get back out with their friends and have a pint of Guinness as a mark of that, was going to be the most amazing experience, the best pint of Guinness they could uh, ever possibly have. And so it was interesting that as much as all of the... Um, you know, we had to find new ways of working together and connecting and so on. Actually, it was, there was a real sort of back to basics moment of ensuring just, you know, the quality of the experience, the quality of the product was going to live up to people's hopes and aspirations as we started to emerge from lockdown. So it was a, a real conduit for change there, uh, positive change, actually, in many ways. And uh, at some lens to go to, though, to take all of the Guinness out, just to make sure that people get the perfect pint when they're back. That's quite, quite remarkable. Uh, Lynette, can we turn to you? What was your biggest challenge um, during this time? Wow, so many challenges, but um, I think one of the key challenges would be um, 
but the constantly changing environment. And, and we're not talking about months or weeks or days. You could have a day and in the span of um, every 10 minutes, something would change, there'll be new information. And I think it's it gets even more acute when you're a global organization and you have many markets to look after and every market is changing by the minute. So the question is, um, how do you get the right information and how do you formulate the right strategies and how do you um, address the needs of consumers and communicating effectively fast? So um, it was really trying to understand and make sense of a very fast changing environment. And we needed to also adjust and adapt. I mean, being in an organization that's quite large where uh, we pride ourselves on quant analysis quant analysis and understanding the business and, and formulating a very cogent strategy. Here we had, it's changing, it's changed again. Um, you know, we need to do something fast. We need to get it out. Oh, consumers are feeling that way. That's an interesting opportunity. Let's do something there. So um, it was really, how do you work with your team across the world to keep them um, on point, to make sure that information was fluid and, and yet that uh, we adapt quickly. So, yeah. Well, it'd be great to the challenges. some of the examples of, of that as, um, as we go through the, the next sort of 40 minutes or so. Sure. Uh, as you say, it was just changing. I mean, Mark, Mark said changing weekly. I think it might even have been more regular than that, that the consumers were changing. But, uh, and Rob, what about you? Slightly different perspective um, from Agency World, perhaps, in terms of the challenges that you faced. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the single biggest challenge is uh, is keeping the teams happy, safe, motivated. Uh, when, when you look at that, and the, the, probably the most obvious points is making sure that everybody, as they switch from a moment where you are you relish from the intensity of working together to being actually uh, being able to actually ad adapt to that moment and say, well, this is wonderful as well, wonderful but different as far as being able to being a part and, and how you build a borderless network in that way to make sure you're moving ideas um, around, but also just making sure that everybody is is happy and safe and, and well. Um, I, I, I agree with Lynette, I think the biggest challenge is for everybody is around the adaptability. Um, and what was fascinating about that, of course, is it, you say expressing is we were seeing waves of change going on around the world. And as you had one market in one situation, we had a, another market in a radically different situation. Um, and, and that meant we probably saw that initial burst of intensity that came in of, right, we need to understand, like Mark was saying, how do we take assets or take work that we're about to do, stop it, change it, build something new. What do we do to make sure we react quickly? That pause to say, well, what does it mean of how do we emerge in six, eight weeks time? And then also that sort of that view through to a medium term of well, what does, how do we exist in this new world? So we were seeing waves of those different sort of different start points coming from around the world um, and being able to help have the teams working and supporting one, one another, being able to say, hey, this is what we saw at this stage was really useful to help people adapt and, and, and move towards it. Um, but, but I think it's, it's been uh, challenging for, for clients and sort of and the agency world um, and making sure that normal timelines have been collapsed and moved in different ways. Um, but I also think this is something that we shouldn't lose is that adaptability should be at the core of the way in which we, we necessarily must work going mm. forward. So I think it's also brought a lot of lessons. Yeah. Well, talking of lessons, I think uh, with, I mean, with challenge uh, comes learning, right? And uh, I, I guess that would be my, my sort of next question for you all is, is so what's, what's your biggest learning to, to date? And, and maybe Lynette, we can start with you. Um, I think in, in terms of the process in my organization, um, it's very important to be very data driven, to be very insights driven, to have great clarity on what the business problem is. So it's a process of learning and it's iterative in formulating a strategy. So I think the greatest learning for the entire team has been in this situation, speed trumps perfection. Um, and that, that has been a hard lesson and has been an interesting lesson and it has been fun as well. 
um, because I think we had to let go of certain paradigms and ways of working and to, to pick up new skills. Um, so, and, and I would imagine, you know, that had implications on how we work as a team in terms of um, reviewing the process and also in terms of how we work the terms of engagement with the agencies. Um, for them, of course, in terms of our partners, it meant that deadlines and timelines were shortened. Um, campaigns that would have taken perhaps, perhaps, you know, three months or month in terms of a global launch, it would be, okay, um, let's get something out in three days. Or, you know, we need to get something out tonight. Yeah, and yeah. do you think that's cha a change that will stick for the long term? I beg your pardon? Do you think those changes, so the move to a much faster process, do you think that's something that will stick for the long term? Um, definitely. I yeah. think definitely will change. But I think when, when we come out of this pandemic, there'll be two ways of working. It doesn't mean we throw away the old. Um, there's still a lot of merit in, in, in really um, analysing the situation. But in terms of executing, we need to be fast. So it's a balance of the two, I would say. What about you, Mark? You I, I really recognise what Lynette says about um, speed beating perfection. And, um, uh, and I think for us, it kind of accelerated some things that we've maybe talked about in the past of areas in which we'd like to see the culture change, but suddenly, you know, um, the circumstances forced it to happen. Uh, and one of those um, for us is kind of moving away from the neatness of an annual plan with an annual budget and knowing what your assets are going to be and what the calendar is going to be. Um, and, and instead having this more, I suppose, kind of real time marketing of um, being, uh, having to be ready uh, uh, to respond to, um, to the changing times. And I can see a couple of things with that, that now as we've been doing this for about maybe five or six months, I can feel some people yearning for the certainty of where, okay, where is my annual plan now? And um, can you tell me what's, what's, what are we going to do for Christmas? What are, what are we going to do afterwards? And of course, uh, actually, I do think this is something that's going to stick of the, the, um, the, the power of not gi giving ourselves those kind of artificial boundaries, but being ready to respond. That said, there is, I think, a risk about it that it draws us into being overly short term. Um, and uh, about a decade ago, I was lucky enough to, um, uh, to work in Russia for three years and life in, life in Moscow was volatile. Things changed rapidly. Um, and um, one of the things I learned there is at one stage, we became a business that was really good at dealing with crises. Um, but we only really evolved as a business when we also had a sense of where we wanted to go over the medium term as well. So that as we sort of navigated our way from crisis to crisis, it was in pursuit of uh, a, 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 a well illustrated vision and direction. And I think that's a balance that we're going to have to get now as well. We don't have certainty about how things are going to play out, particularly in the industry that I'm in or that Lynette's in. Um, but, um, uh, but we do need to make sure that our, our short term actions are still in direction of the vision of where we want to go. Yeah, so it's, so it's in service of something. So you, you need the North Star and maybe a framework to work within, but, but with the flexibility to, to execute much more, much more speedily. Absolutely. Makes sense, makes sense. What about you, Rob? I mean, I, I, I think it's probably in service of that as well. I think we saw very quickly that, yes, you needed to react and yes, you needed to have teams ready to go and change and build, but you also needed to make sure that you were looking up and looking out. Um, and, and the need ever more to make sure that you're understanding where, where things were going. And again, taking maybe different sources for insight generation. Um, but I think our, our, our strategists have never been busier um, or, more, or more required. Um, and also, again, as a connected network, we're never more useful than being able to, say, to, to share learnings and understanding. Um, to be able to make sure that you could formulate, because I think what we saw was very reactive moments um, and sometimes very open briefs. Um, and I think as we got better and just, I think it very quickly moved into really fantastic relationships with our clients where actually solidifying the brief well 
even at, a, at speed was very necessary to make sure what you were pointing at because there were so many different ways in which you could point an answer. So I, I think that was interesting and the insight generation and the forward looking insight generation was very, very important and, and will continue to be. And no one has a crystal ball and no one will know the solid answer. But I think these understanding markers at these moments and then getting sharp about what you're asking also allows for speed, not just being generating lots of ideas and just sort of throwing them out into the, the ether um, and wasting lots of time because time becomes ever more valuable um, as, we're, as we're building at, at this pace. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting time, isn't it? Because you're, I think you're all saying that there's uh, a focus on the short term and doing things much better, more efficiently, much uh, speedier. But also businesses are facing, I mean, existential questions in many ways, you know, in terms of what they're going to be in the future. And so that requires some real strategic long term thinking. Fascinating times. I'm, I want to switch now a bit more to uh, focusing specifically on innovation and creativity. And uh, Lynette, if I can start with you, just I'd like you to tell us a bit about um, how you've harnessed creativity uh, during the pandemic to keep uh, Singapore front of mind. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, where I come from, part, the partnership with um, the wider ecosystem, the wider travel eco ecosystem is important. So that's one consideration. Of course, the partnership with our creative agencies and our agencies is very important. So um, one major piece of work that we've, we've sort of finessed and fine-tuned and launched during this period um, is really how we work with the community, the community of creators and the larger travel industry to harness their creativity. So apart from working for agencies on um, putting out work, and, and I can talk quite a fair bit about that, it was also thinking through how can we work with the creative sector in Singapore to tell the great Singapore story? So one of the things we did um, was uh, to set up a fund, to set up um, a Singapore Stories creative fund that creators, whether you're a filmmaker, you're a content maker, you know, you're a great photographer that you can tap on. And if you've got a great story in whatever medium, um, you can tell that story. So I think in today's world, um, creativity has been, um, it, it's, it's more democratic. It doesn't just belong to the brand, right? If, if the brand is to represent the people, then you need to let the people tell the story. So that, that has been one element that we've been honing and thinking about. Um, the other piece, of course, is uh, with the agency, um, you know, we are usually very, uh, uh, very particular about a good brief. But I think what, what this is, pandemic has taught us is there needs to be some um, freedom within the framework where there could be uh, faster conversations, more casual conversations, more brainstorming to get something out and fast. It doesn't need to be too formal. So, and also um, creativity um, does, it's not, um, it doesn't just belong to a single team or to a single agency. Um, the creative process and the ideation and the ideas can come from many different parts of uh, the marketing uh, ecosystem. So yeah, does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, it does have some great insights there. Now, I should just say, I'm going to another question in a minute, but I should just say that on the Q&A uh, to our panellists, uh, there's a couple of quite specific questions for Mark and Lynette at the minute. So if you feel able to multitask, feel free to answer in, in writing those. I'm not sure we're going to get to them. It's a particularly long uh, one for you, Mark. Um, so have a look at that whilst we're going. Um, and actually, Mark, whilst we're talking to you, I think, I mean, Diageo is well known for its innovations right at the core of the business. Um, can you tell us a bit more about why it's so important to Diageo and, and the values that have guided you over this sort of period that have allowed you to make the sort of big, brave decisions around creativity? Yeah, I mean, uh, it really does sit at the heart of um, uh, uh, the kind of philosophy of Diageo um, that uh, our brands are in the entertainment business and that therefore the, the best way for us to bring our brands to life um, is by creating an emotional connection that so many people have because they associate their their favorite night out with their friends, their favorite time they've had people over to their house, that our brands are present in those moments and, and help to mark those moments. Um, and certainly on, on Guinness in particular, it's something... Um, 
that you know it goes all the way back in the history of Guinness of um, Arthur Guinness deciding he was going to brew black beer when the rest of the world was brewing ale. Um, there's something about that Guinness doing things in a way that is different from anyone else. And we have this expression that we write on all of our briefs, which is OGCD, uh, which means only Guinness can do. Um, and really it's a sort of standard or a threshold that if actually the response, whether it is um, a piece of communication or a below the line activation, if you can picture it being done by a different beer brand or indeed by um, a, a different other kind of brand, then it's not quite right for Guinness. Um, and, um, you know, that's a, 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 it's quite a tough benchmark because one of the things that it leads you to do is often um, have to uh, constantly recreate and, and reinvent. Um, and at times, I, I feel sometimes in the past when we've had a, a, a hugely successful piece of communications, like for example, the Surfer ad all the way back in 1999, or more recently, the Sapers ad in 2015, we fall into this trap of thinking, oh, there's a model from this ad. I can, you know, there's a, there's a model as to why this works and we can follow that model and recreate it. And as soon as you start doing that, it's never quite the same uh, again. Um, and, uh, I, I, and so that uh, it, takes, it takes a huge amount of trust to be able to, to constantly be driving change and that level of searching for a new expression. Um, and I actually think that's one of the, the reasons why um, having a long-term relationship we, we're 22 years with bbdo um that really matters um because um you have partners that you can uh, that you know really get the brand uh, are just as much guardians of it as any of the people that that actually uh, work uh, for diageo for guinness um uh, uh, and they understand that the path forward for us is about constantly reinventing and finding fresh um narratives for guinness yeah, yeah. So you set yourself a very high bar, clearly, and I can sort of see it's slightly paradoxical because we're also talking about, um, you know, perfection, not not trumping speed. And so I'm sure that's brought up some challenges for you over that, that the course of these last few months. Um, Rob, um, switching to how you have um, been supporting your clients during this time as they've been pivoting and changing their business models. How, how has that felt over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, again, to, to sort of echo Mark's point there as well, I think this idea of um, an entertainment mindset, moving from a marketing mindset to an entertainment mindset, I think is a really important move within sort of the industry overall. And hopefully it was something we were seeing come through outside of, of sort of the, the necessity driven from pandemic. And I think that's entertainment in its purest terms as far as seeking value exchange between people and brands instead of just sort of interrupting. So uh, would I seek it out? So again, thinking about those questions, would I seek it out? Would I queue for it? Would I pay for it when I tell people about it? How do we make sure that the markers of the work that we're creating um, are competing with a sea of astonishing creativity that's going on at the moment um, all around the world? And also at the same time, understanding other factors that are going on as far as collapsing of, of traditional funnels. So things like we were working with Cholula Hot Sauce in the US, we were about to go live with a, a campaign at the beginning of lockdown that quickly switched into being something which was about a fundraising for, uh, for restaurants and became a tackathon. And we were able to work with talent and build something which was entertaining, which was interesting um, and, and work really well against the demands that were, were coming through uh, right then and there, um, working with uh, the Dubai, Dubai Tourism um, Authority and working with them to build out, uh, say, music video content um, that really expresses well uh, the city and shows the landscape and what goes on behind it. But at the core of it is making sure that it's, there are business goals, there are key business sort of demands that we place on this, but the value of the creativity and the work that you're putting out there is that that you would you would you would put it against other sort of other entertainment um, and and you would actually actually actively seek it out. So I think that's true, and we many different examples through lockdown of where we were helping look at some of the switches, say with Urban Decay in China and the demands to drive people through to Tmall, um, and so from an e-commerce play, but we had we were shooting uh, as sort of advertising through lockdown, uh, shooting it down WeChat as well, and and streaming in like lots of different sort of mechanics to it, but ultimately 
this is making sure that we're reframing the demands on creativity today, uh, which I think is a wonderful challenge for the industry at large and from a client's sort of in general. And Rob, Rob whilst, whilst you're there and talking, I think um, I was going to take one of the questions from the Q&A, um, which I think uh, you will like answering. So it's, it's about the democratization of creativity. So it's from Simon Suto and he's saying, how did, how did the panel feel about the democratization of creativity? Does it lead to a loss of control? What's your thoughts on that? I don't, you look at something like uh, Gymshark in the UK, which has just been valued at a, a, a billion pound business um, and has been built off of influencer marketing. Um, uh, and I think it, and, and, and a lot of intelligence and great products, but I think there are really interesting demands on the, on, on the industry and, and where creativity come, comes from. Um, uh, I think the demands on making sure that you have craft and that, that you have people working uh, with a great range of influence and ideas means that you get to far more interesting work. And I think we're at an interesting time in the industry where the craft and the thinking that comes from traditional advertising and from great upstream thinking and providing wonderful platforms to build brilliant creative from is, is really, really important. But the voices that influence that uh, and those who, and some of the craft of how you bring that to life, well, you know what, like we need to think into, into that entertainment mindset again. We need to think in how you deploy it uh, in sort of in a different way. So I think these range of voices are important, but unnecessarily shift the industry and shift some of the old God out. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on that from, from Matt or Mark? Yeah, I, I agree and um... You know, we've, uh, we did our first proper foray into, we worked with uh, a partner called Tribal that several of you might know of um, when we were, when we found ourselves in lockdown and unable to do a normal shoot and also finding we didn't really have any assets for people to, uh, for about drinking Guinness at home and suddenly needed to find a way. And it was a really energizing process and it, 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 um, it was very quick. It was able to be done within the, the constraints um, and it brought in some different voices that we don't normally uh, work with. Um, and I think it also broke down a little bit some of the walls between um, the agency and the client, you know, not least because they were each operating it out of their kitchens and, um, um, and, and we all learned a lot and everyone felt very engaged in, in, in that process. Um, I do think, and Simon is a, a good ex show man and, uh, and will um, we'll know well, one of the um, constraints for us is around as uh, an industry that is, uh, that we, we set our own regulation quite high and, uh, and therefore ensuring that work that is done uh, that's consumer generated, that still fits within um, the Diageo marketing code, it can be a challenge at times. And that's one of the areas where control is helpful to us. Um, but um, I start off my day every day um, by uh, just searching hashtag Guinness, uh, hashtag Bailey's, hashtag uh, Captain Morgan on Twitter and then on Instagram. And what you see from that isn't necessarily people kind of creating content as such, but it's how people are choosing to mark their moments with uh, our, our brands. Um, and I find it always tells a story. Uh, the story changes with the seasons, with what's going on, um, but it's one of the, um, the, the great sources of insight, um, uh, I think, of uh, um, just being able to, to see the way that people are interacting. Just talking about that, one of the questions on the Q and A is um, is uh, from Saffron Inkster, which is how, how do you think customer expectations have changed as a result of the pandemic? Do you want to just pick that one up? I'm I'm gonna hi Lynette. Um, I'm just gonna jump on something that Rob said and and tie it back to customer expectations. Um, I think even more so in the pandemic, especially when. Um, you know, there were certain periods across many different markets, you know, everyone's in a different time timeline. In terms of being stuck at home and, and locked down at home, um, where brands really had to to create pull content because people were getting bored easily and yet they wanted to be entertained. Um, so the point you made, Rob, about marketing having to pivot to become entertainment, uh, was really, really critical. And, and that's where I think when you talk about the, 
you know, making sure that creativity can come from many different places and from many different uh, parts of the marketing ecosystem or the entertainment ecosystem. And I think with constraints comes, um, comes creativity. So for example, um, one of the things we asked ourselves was, you know, we can't have events anymore, right? So how then do we bring the event or the experience of an event to folks around the world? Can we have, can we have a food festival? Sounds a bit crazy, but we just did. We had a food festival, we, we delivered food, we had food tours. Um, so that has forced us to create fun content and hopefully to draw audiences in, uh, in a different way. So I think how we view marketing in terms of a lot of push um, has forced us to be more about cool and fun, interesting education, educational and entertaining content. And has your attitude to um, things going wrong changed? I'm talking to really all of you, but starting with you, you Lynette, uh, because obviously you know, an inherent part of being innovative is that you're pushing yourself further than you might have done before. And so in doing that, inevitably things go wrong. And indeed, many would believe that's a crucial part of learning. So uh, for all of you really, but perhaps starting with you, Lynette, is there anything you, that sort of stands out for you you think that has gone wrong that you, you've learned from over these last few months? Uh, I wouldn't say gone wrong, but I think it, as Singapore, we, we love planning, right? We love order, we love planning, you know, things need to be perfect. And I think when the pandemic hit, we went into planning mode you know beautiful frameworks you know framing of you know when are you going to launch this and and then it slowly dawned on us that this pandemic was different in every single market across the world and then we had to really really stick to you know a, a dictum that we hold ourselves by which is freedom in a framework so we had to have a very cogent framework but enough freedom in it so that there was a lot of flexibility to move. And, and that was a learning um, for us. It was a big learning and we're still learning. Good, good. And what about you, Rob? You've, um, you've obviously had to totally change the way that you produce work and people in multiple locations around the world and so on. And, and as you say, shooting at home and so on. What, what would you say are the sort of key learnings that have come out? I suppose just that somewhat that we can um, uh, and, and I think what, what's lovely is that when you have that, that mindset and you have, it, it is such a liberator, um, and going at things in a, in a terms in which, well, we must fly X number of people around the world. Um, uh, we were about, we were about to, for a client, we were about to fly in 250 people to an island in the Dominican Republic. Um, and, and that didn't happen, but again, quickly adapting to make sure that you can do things which have no less impact but they work in a, in a different way and now coming off the back back of it i would expect that to be additive going into next year versus one one or one or the other um so it, it just it changes mindsets um and 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 sometimes that shows some people who can't um and i think some of that is helping people learn and or helping sort of find find new ways for them to sort of work within within the industry um and then i think this overall as an industry um, we've loved the way in which we have four weeks for this, three months for that, five weeks. Like we, we've created uh, an armory around us uh, or an armor around us. Um, and that this openness, I think someone said about you're sitting in everyone's houses. You are talking to them as they've got their kids on their laps. Um, the humanity changed completely. So actually mistakes were, were, were part of the fallibility that was being expressed through, through all of the interactions you were having. And like Lynette said, I, I don't think that people would actually mark things as many mistakes, but too cliche, but they were learnings that were built upon, but they were recycled very quickly. And I think some of the things that changed is, is things go wrong, people want to learn from them, but they often get put back in a box and never opened again. And therefore you get repeated that the, what has happened far faster is you've learned from adapted and changed quicker through through the process and i think that's been really really healthy both for the industry sort of the advertising side and from a client side um and that it has been done with that sort of that collective agreement and um, that this is this is permission to go and do that yeah 
yeah, makes sense. Just picking up on, on something you said there, Rob, so, so on the one hand, so there's a sort of positive aspect of working remotely is you get to see uh, behind the veil, maybe, you know, see people as human beings rather than just colleagues or stakeholders or whatever. Um, so that's, I think that's been a great upside. Perhaps one of the other uh, less positive things is, is the risk of burnout and the fact that, that the, the normal barriers between home and work have sort of been taken down. I'm maybe ask the question of you, Mark, is uh, people being on much more, is there a risk of burnout? And how do you manage that and keep your teams motivated when you're driving creativity? No, I think there's a real risk of burnout. And uh, it's interesting, I feel this week in particular, and this uh, it feels like is marking a phase for a lot of people that are in my teams. It's back to school. Um, it's, and also the days starting to shorten, um, the, the summer's over. And actually we're taking that as a prompt to, um, uh, to, to help people get back into good habits. And I do really agree with what was, Robert said about the, the kind of humanizing effect of being able to, um, of everyone being in the same boat and getting at that little uh, screen shaped window into people's lives. Um, part of that, I think as leaders is ensuring that people are okay to say, I need some time out. And, and actually I think one of the things that um, I'd really encourage to everyone is just take a bit of control of your diary to the extent that you can to have gaps in to do whatever gives you energy, um, which for me is taking the dogs out for a walk or, uh, or, or doing a bit of exercise um, and making sure that you prioritize that in the, in the diary because it's so easy to not do that. And then as you say, the, the, uh, you don't have the commute to mark the start and finish of the, uh, of the day. Um, and I, I think we've certainly seen that. I think everyone will have experienced moments of that, of, um, um, uh, of, of either Zoom fatigue or just not having the variety in our, our daily um, lives that we normally do, where um, you'll go from a sort of uh, a stand-up meeting with lots of people in it to an energizing brainstorm to a, um, uh, uh, to kind of some time on your own. You know, all of it is uh, uh, is more consistently looking at the screen. So, so therefore, all the more important to um, to make sure that you're you're managing your energies really effectively. Yeah, very very wise words. Thank you, Mark. So I wanted to switch tack to, uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left, so I know there's, there's a couple of questions on the Q&A we should pick up, but um, Lynette, just um, turning our, our thoughts to the, to the future, what, what does the future uh, look like for you? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but um, tell us about how you think travel and the way people interact uh, with travel will change. Uh, is it going to change forever? You know, um... Mark, Mark, you said something very interesting that really resonated with me. I think the beauty of, of being in the office is just a variety of different environments, right? It just puts you in a different mood. So I think that's the thing. It's about um, the experience and the variety of experience. I don't think um, the travel lust uh, will ever disappear. I, I do think with, with the pandemic, I think the craving to travel has probably been made more acute. I do think the concerns and the consumer demands will change drastically. Perhaps pre-pandemic, if you think about it, you know, um, it was so easy to travel. Uh, it was so easy to book a flight. It was relatively cheap. Um, it was fast and you can just get go anywhere in the world and book a flight any time of the day um, it's that's going to change and i think people would demand um, on a hygiene level safety safety is going to be bread and butter and after that it would be because i think travel is going to be more precious and will become i would say more of a scarce commodity i think people will be more thoughtful and more deliberate they will plan more they would demand more and, and with that, I think for all of us as travel marketeers and destinations and experience creators, um, it's on us to really raise the bar. And, and it's, it's a tough time to raise the bar because there are many constraints. Um, the old paradigm of um, what watching a play is in a theater, the old paradigm of going to a club and enjoying music and uh, you know a, a glass of champagne or beer, or dining in a restaurant. It's every experience will have to 
be reviewed and changed. So it's it's an exciting period. Um, it's 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 kind of like the um, you know in Charles Dickens' day, it was the industrial revolution. We are going through a revolution right now, and and I'm I'm very hopeful that and I'm very positive that it's a renaissance moment. I'm an optimist. I love that. I love the idea of people being more thoughtful about travel anyway. I think perhaps the environment uh, demands it of us. Um, I want to uh, switch tack to leadership now and um, uh, just talk a bit about, um, about the kind of leadership we need through these times. Because I think it's clear uh, from everything that you've been saying is that fundamentally relationships and, and particularly trust are, are will be are, are key and have been key over these last few months to creative and commercial success in challenging times. So um, starting with you, perhaps, Mark, as a, as a leader, how do you set the tone uh, and what advice would you give for uh, you know, achieving that sort of trust between clients and agencies and teams? I think, um, there's, I, I, I think we're really lucky, to be honest, that we have built strong relationships and foundations to come into this time because it's harder to establish new relationships um, uh, through Zoom um, and, and at this time. And, and we really have got deep relationships with a lot of our agency partners. Um, that said, we've had some quite difficult conversations with them as well around reviewing the level of work that we're going to have. Um, and actually, uh, at one stage, we we probably thought there was going to be less than actually there now is as we realise um, that we can do more and also that we need to do more as we respond to, to consumers. But I think there's something that's really important, therefore, in those relationships and actually in, um, in my teams uh, as well, that um, leaders need to uh, face reality and give hope, um, uh, which is something uh, um, one of my old bosses used to, to say a great deal. Giving hope's really important. Um, having a, a, a sense of a, a brighter future and something that people can look forward to and aim towards is critical. But that has to be grounded in reality so that it's not just a sort of naive, uh, hopeful view of, of the future. It has to start from fully understanding where we are today, but also knowing what we can do to make it better. And actually, if there was one thing that I have found has made um, our teams, both across the agency and within Diageo, energized, it's starting to do things, feeling like you're making a contribution, feeling like you're bringing some work to consumers that's going to help them to have a treat in their day and, uh, and get through the, the day. Um, so uh, that, that sense of face reality, give hope, I think is, uh, is critical. Mm. And giving people purpose, right? I think it sounds like. Uh, and Rob, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, I, that element of, I think now we, the demands on us as leaders is to help radical change come through. Um, and, and that's what it demands that we are necessarily, I think there's a healthy organization, a healthy society is one which says that sort of the brighter days are, are to come and you're not looking over your shoulder. Um, I don't, I think everyone's kind of understood that what we're not trying to do is, is rebound into something that was. Um, so that element of providing radical sort of, a radical vision for it is is incredibly important at the moment and we've seen that but that taking the steps along along the way and i think that that came almost when you saw the start of lockdown where that flurry of energy turned into a flurry of output um uh, and both sort of alongside our, our our partners but then also internally in in my agency around the world people were starting fitness classes at seven o'clock in the morning and they were doing uh, uh, meetups in, in the evenings and they're doing book clubs and one of our teams coded uh, an app to do serendipitous meetups um, uh, called Chit Chat um, because they were missing bumping into people. And so I think it is that element of, of, of producing things that allow you to move along that, the, the, that process. Um, fortunately or not fortunately the, the everything has been sped up so i think we're seeing things we're, we're going through cycles far faster um but allowing for that that vision and that vision allows you to take a step along it take it 
six weeks out, three months out, and then sort of setting into 21 and, and sort of going, going forward um, really, really helps people move along, move along that process. And I think the other side is the, is the fallibility, is making sure that I think leadership comes from saying what you do and don't know. Um, and the sort of the honesty to admit that this is something that you are on a journey with everybody um, and that you are garnering their support and their input um, all the way along this. And we've had, like, our teams have been incredible about driving that change themselves um, and then scaling it, scaling it around the world and being sort of feeling those connections. And that, that became incredibly important very quickly. I would be the first one to admit I don't know, uh, don't know a lot. Um, so uh, having the team's input to that was, was made some of those big shifts. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, we're running out of time as we knew we would, but um, uh, before we come to our sort of final question for, for you guys, just quick, quickly popping back to the Q&A again. So uh, there's loads of interesting questions on here. Sorry, sorry, audience, we'll never get through them all, I'm afraid, but we'll pick them up afterwards. Uh, there's a question here from Kerry, uh, Kerry Flouse, which says, uh, well, you can read it yourselves, but uh, it's in essence uh, asking about the ecosystem and say, you know, asking you all, do you feel that brands and agencies will now take a wider lens and look to fresh and new parts of the marketing ecosystem to find creative ideas and brand partners to be a part of the mix. Any perspectives on that? One hundred percent. I think. I mean, I think that's that's some of what is is the most exciting in that radical change. And like we said, the radical rethinking of a funnel um, and the way in which people are are, are consuming um, or not um, is 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 very very important for us to to grasp. Um, the, the ecosystem looking at sort of a metaverse um being able to understand that we are going to be engaging with people sort of inside a, a gaming environment and that is as valid a space in which that you're going to be transacting with people and maybe attracting from a talent perspective um as it is in physical retail um we've worked in various different ways along that and i, I think it is taking that step forward and making sure that you are really well educated and you've got brilliant sort of experienced teams to, to, to help think that and you've got experts coming into to the business. So not trying to fake it, not trying just to say everybody in these four walls are the only people who can, can solve this um, uh, and, and having the humility and that curiosity to say in these changes, we mustn't be left behind. So uh, and embracing those and making those steps on that journey. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Great answer. Um, one other, just picking up from Anna Harris here, which uh, maybe uh, Lynette, you can pick up, which is, do you think the voice of the customer is now a digital voice? Interesting question. Uh, um, well, I think, you know, with the pandemic, it has really underscored the importance of um, being very clear in the digital space, especially in the social space, your brand voice, what you stand for, so that when they see you, they know, okay, that's Singapore or, or that's, you know, um, XYZ brand. Um, but I, I do believe that for travel, when markets do open up, I do think um, pre-pandemic, there was a lot of um, thinking and a lot of work around experience marketing. I do think elements of that will come back it would take on a different shape and form. I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, digital is extremely important. We need to have a very clear identity and brand voice and be, be, be innovative on social. There's a lot of same, same, if you know what I mean. But post pandemic, we need to think how to balance that with the experience on ground, because that's not gonna go away. People will still want that pint of beer in that pub how do you tell your brand story there? So just some thoughts going through uh, my mind and my team's mind. So keeping balance is gonna be important. Yes. Uh, good advice, thank you. So listen, um, I wanna turn just to uh, each of you now, um, in no more than a minute each, because we're rapidly running out of time, is just uh, what's the one key piece of advice you'd leave our audience uh, with today if they want to drive greater creative success. So maybe I'll start with you, Mark, on that one, one key piece of advice. Now, uh, my one key piece of advice would be my one big learning from this, which is um, to listen harder and follow harder what's happening to the consumer, what's happening externally, and, and be ready to respond. Um, the head of 72 and Sunny, who are our Smirnoff agency, was saying the other day, you know, 
we don't need a million dollar ad for this. We need ten hundred thousand dollar ads um, so that we can be ready to respond and um, and be relevant as things change so much. So um, uh, listen more, respond more, and uh, um, and don't don't sit in a, a neat annual plan. Yeah, love that. Great advice, Lynette. Sorry, um, I guess one piece of advice I would have would be. Um, to be open and to embrace working with many, many different um, creatives out there. It could be, you know, that, that one, that entrepreneur who just set up a pancake shop, he probably has a very interesting way of telling your brand story. Or, you know, the fletching uh, uh, um, skateboarder, he can showcase your destination in a way no one else can. So this is what I mean by creativity can be found in many different delightful places. So I think we need to be open and embrace that. Love that. Love that. Thank you. Evan from Pancake Shops, the skateboarders. And Rob? Yeah, I, I think it is ex uh, finding the marriage of experience and youth or naivety. Um, and my concern is as you look at the dynamics going into a recession is that typically um, younger people find it hard to get a job and, and you go you go safer in the way in which you're you are hiring and that's an understandable um, but but the necessity at the moment for the radical change we need to drive is it will be the things that we're not seeing so like Lynette was saying looking into different places with different people find looking into different corners um, and ensuring we see that will come from a different range of voices. So there's going to be a marriage and then we have to make sure that the next generation of creatives aren't left on a shelf for the next three, four years um, as a pandemic and a recession rips through, but they are the voices that are helping drive that change. Yeah. yeah. What a great way to end. Um, listen, uh, these conversations can always go on for at least another hour and, and this one's been no exception so I'll, thank you so much uh, what a brilliant conversation has been uh, some great wisdom and insights have been shared with us there i think and um, we will collate some of those tips and learnings uh, to share with all of our members uh, over the coming days and um, so if you've enjoyed today uh, or if you've not uh, please let us know uh, on our feedback poll which uh, we always have it'll be appearing on your screens uh, in a moment um, just need to get rid of mine so I can see what I've got to say. Um, so please fill that in, let us know what you think. Um, just quickly, what's next from us and the Marketing Society? We've always got lots going on. But, uh, so next Tuesday, uh, the 8th of September at 12 o'clock, uh, British Summer Time, we're hosting a webinar discussing the impact of COVID-19 on consumer attitudes to digital payments. Um, and the following week, uh, on Thursday, the 17th of September at 10 a.m. BST, we're hosting a, a virtual under the spotlight session with the former CMO of Netflix, uh, Jacqueline Lee Jo. So that will be fascinating. So please join us for those that are available to book online now. And uh, I hope to see you there. So um, thank you uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you to, to our audience for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure to host this session. Uh, and uh, go off and enjoy the rest of your days and stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.